I read the news recently and got upset. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> you don't read the news to feel good, do you? Uh, you know, I, I was reading the news and I saw an article that grabbed my attention and I knew it was clickbait, but I couldn't help myself. You know, you, you fight that inclination sometimes when you know what's behind the curtain. But here was the, here was the title of the article, and then you tell me if you could resist. The title of the article was this. Every Rocky movie definitively ranked, including the new Creed 3. I was like, what? Every Rocky movie definitively ranked, including the new Creed 3. So, as we all know, there are nine Rocky movies, if you include the new Creed series, trilogy or whatever. And so, you, you know, um, that's a lot of movies to think about. So as, I'm th as I read that article, I'm like, oh, I mean, I like articles like that better than stuff uh, like world news and things like that. So I'm like, you know, I I'm curious what's, how, that is, how that plays out. You know, it's nine being the worst, one being the best. What are they going to put after Rocky IV? Because obviously any sane human being that knows anything about anything in life whatsoever uh, knows that Rocky IV is the best Rocky movie of the entire Rocky verse. That's just, that's just easy. That's easy stuff, right? So then, so this, this moron puts Rocky four ranked number five. And so I'm like, the, the movie stopped the Cold War. How are you going to put Rocky four number five on this list? I mean, the, the training montage alone in Rocky IV should have had its own ranking on that list. It's, it was appalling. But, you know, we don't read the news to feel good, and, uh, uh, but that's, that's how that, that shaked out reading that article. But, you know, all of the Rocky movies are essentially the same. We'd have to agree on that at least. You know, the, 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 if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just keep making the same movie over and over and associate it even remotely to Rocky Balboa and we'll all watch it. We'll, we're, we're there. We're, we're hooked. It's the same thing. You know, you got your favorite underdog, which is usually Rocky up until the new Creed series. And, and so you, you got the underdog facing a new challenge. And usually the movie starts out with that underdog getting the crap beat out of him in some way, and you're thinking, oh, man, this, it's over for Rocky. And, but it's never over, is it? <laughs> We're nine movies deep. It's never over. He gets back up. He's not down for, forever. And he starts training and flips on some 80s music and starts the montage, and, and then he's prepared, right? But every, every Rocky movie is the same, but, and it teaches us the lesson that if we train and if we prepare, we will be ready. If we don't train, if we don't try, if we don't prepare, we will not be ready for the opposition. And we'll be conquered by it. You know, I, this article came to mind as I was studying and preparing this sermon over Galatians because Galatian, the, the book of Galatians kind of functions like this. This is kind of like our theological and doctrinal training montage as we participate in a study through this book of the Bible. Because this book is written, it's a letter or an epistle written to the people of Galatia so that they would be ready for opposition when it comes. And so without training, without thinking critically about what they believe, opposition is going to happen and they're going to let go of what they believe and, and be duped by something else. And so just like in these Rocky movies, like if it, in, in our walk with the Lord, if we don't train, if we don't exercise our faith, if we don't think critically about what we believe, whenever, whenever this world punches us in the face, as it has the tendency to do, we're not going to be ready for it. We're not going to be able to take it. We're going to we're going, to be, we're going to fall into doubt. We're going to be insecure. And isn't it amazing how quickly and how suddenly some people can just abandon their faith when the first like, sign of opposition arises in their life? I mean, doing ministry for so long now, I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone raised in the church and loved by Christians, taught the gospel, and, and then... You know, when they, they get older, they become an adult, something bad happens in their life, and then bam! Well, I can't believe God let that happen. He's mean. I'm out. Just, just like that. Like the first bad thing that happens. I, I'm out. This is hard. This is complicated. So God gets the blame. You're always like, man, you know, if you're just going to, you know, 
throw, throw God out the window and blame him when something bad goes down in your life, like, wh- who's next on that list, right? You just abandon everybody? Every, you blame somebody else every single time? Like, you know, or, or, or how about when somebody's raised in the church, they grow up in the Christian faith, and they go to college, and, and the first professor that has anything critical to say about what Christians believe, it's like, oh, man, he must be right. He's got a doctorate degree. And so I, I'm, I'm out. You know, and I, and I remember being, I remember being that college student at IU, and I was an education major when I was at IU, but I, I needed several elective courses, and so I got into the religious studies courses. Now, if you want to study r- religious studies, um, and, and from a Christian worldview, IU's not the place to do that. <laughs> and so, uh, but I remember taking, I started with Christianity 101, and I took New Testament 1, then took New Testament 2, and I remember showing up to these classes, and they were all taught just by raging, raging atheists. I mean, it, every single day was just brutal. It was the beating. You believe this stuff? Every single day was this, this, these professors like, hey, get your Bible out. Turn to, in, in the New Testament class, turn to the letters of Paul. And I'm going to tell you why you can't trust a word this guy's saying. Let me tell you why this is wrong. It, it, like semesters of it, and then you take classes, and you take the test, and you know, you know how college goes, you know, you got to give them the answers they want. If you want to pass that class or you're in trouble, it was brutal. But a lot of times we get in those situations, and, and man, we, we got to make a choice. Am I going to think critically about what I believe, or, or am I just going to buy everything that this guy has to say hook, line, and sinker? Am I just going to accept that, or am I going to embrace the challenge and prepare and get ready? You know, I, I, l- I learned a few things in that experience. Uh, one is um, you can find smart people with high IQs on both sides of practically every one of those arguments. That was a good thing to understand. But another thing is that uh, none of those arguments that you would hear in there are new. These are o- o- Christianity is old. If you hear an argument against the Christian faith, you need to know that's not the first time someone's made that argument. You got to understand, people have been making arguments against this faith for a long, long time, and, and there's been a back and forth going on for a long, long time. So that's the third thing I had to understand in that situation, is just because I didn't have an answer didn't mean there wasn't an answer. That's a really important thing for all of us to understand. If you get stumped, just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean that there's not an answer. That's a very prideful thing to think, that there can't be an answer just because you don't know it, right? And so, we have, we, but when we get in those scenarios, right, we got to make a choice. Am I going to... Am I going to train? Am I going to prepare? Am I going to be willing to think critically about what I believe to be ready? It's, it's a shame how today so often Christians will just, man, not only will they not uh, think critically in those types of scenarios, they, they can't even survive like a social media platform, right, with all these zingers. <laughs> when you, you get... You get on social media, if you have any social media account whatsoever, I mean, as a Christian, you just got to know that there's like an army of of raging atheists ready to throw zingers at you against the Christian faith. And, And zingers, what makes a zinger good is when you don't have to think. Whenever you can just read it and get a quick chuckle and be on board immediately, that's what makes a good zinger. And so zingers are so effective because people don't like to think hard. And so they get hit with a zinger, and it's just easier to accept the zinger, whether it be for or against the Christian faith. Right? That goes both ways, doesn't it? Right? You can write zingers in either direction. But it's never quite that easy, is it? When you really think hard and try to flesh out different beliefs and things. But, you know, if, if a zinger ever is really what causes you to take a side or believe something with conviction, you've taken the easy way. That's why, we, that's why we, we take our time through this Bible. We have 66 books in this Bible that help us to understand who God is, help us to under, understand who we are in relationship to him, understand how to live out this life in light of who he is and how we are to live. And, and if we don't take the time to know this material, to prayerfully gather together and encourage one another with this material, we're being lazy. That's why this gathering is so important. That's why actually showing up to church and studying the Bible with other Christians is so critical to our life and faith. It's part of the preparation process. It's part of, it's part of growing. If you don't incorporate this gathering into your life routinely, you're being lazy. 
If you're not taking time to know this content and, and all the different ways there is to know it and, and to incorporate it into your daily life or being lazy and lackadaisical. And so sometimes we need somebody to get in our face and to tell us when we're being lazy. You know who else was lazy at times? Rocky Balboa. You didn't think I'd circle back to him, did you? Sometimes Rocky needed someone to get into his face and rebuke him and tell him, you're being lazy, you're being a bum, Rocky, right? That's, that's what uh, Mickey, that's, that was his role in the Rocky series, was to get in Rocky's face. Do you remember what Mickey said when he got in Rocky's face there? I believe it was Rocky too. I don't remember it. I had to go look it up. But I wrote it down for you. Come on, where are your guts, Rocky? You got a problem, kid. You got a ticker problem. I'll try to get his accent right. <laughs> What's the matter? You got nothing left inside, huh? Because you're training like a dang bum. A bum. Is that good? <laughs> You know, <laughs> Rocky needed that, though. He needed somebody to get in his face and say, say, you're being lazy. If you don't start trying, you are going to fail. So as Paul is writing his letter to the Galatians, he is behaving like Mickey in this sense. He's behaving like the person who has earned the right to get in their face and say, hey, you guys are being lazy, you're being duped, you haven't thought critically about what you believe, and so you're being duped by false teaching. And the, the, the churches of Galatia, they, they've been lazy like Rocky was lazy, they've been defeated so easily by false teaching. And they're just giving up like, like a bunch of bums. And so we, we've only gotten five verses deep into this book, and the first five verses are basically the pleasantries. Hi, I'm Paul. Glad to see you. Uh, remember me? I'm the one that told you about the gospel. Love you guys. And now that that's done, pleasantries are over. It's time to get to why he really wrote this letter. We're going to study verses 6 through 10, and they are strong, strongly worded verses. This is a rebuke. They needed it. You know, you and I need it too. Maybe this morning you need rebuked in the same way they needed rebuked. That's why we need our Bibles. Because we need this to be equipped to live out the Christian life. We need to hear a loving rebuke. We need to hear a harsh rebuke to get where we need to be. Okay, so let's read verses 6 through 10. Listen, listen how strongly Paul words this. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to dis distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. He's astonished. I can't believe it. I'm baffled. I'm shocked. How quickly you all deserted the gospel of Jesus. And again, he's earned the right to say this. We remember that this group of churches in Galatia were planted by Paul. We can read about them in Acts 13 and 14, one of Paul's missionary journeys in which he would go spend a year or two, sometimes three years somewhere, planting a, a church, teaching doctrine, establishing leaders, and then move on to the next community and do this. And so he had spent years of his life teaching them the gospel of Jesus. He knew that they knew better. Ministry was hard there. He was aware that people opposed the gospel there, right? We saw how he, he literally took a beating. He almost died preaching the gospel there. But he established bona fide believers in Galatia. And he's writing to them because since his departure there, they had abandoned the gospel that he taught. Since his departure from there, they had been duped by the opposition. They hadn't thought critically enough about what they believed. They thought they were ready, but they weren't. And when that opposition came, when that false teaching hit in their area and in their church, they began to just give in to it like a bunch of bums. 
It is amazing how quickly churches can abandon the gospel of Jesus, right? We think one of the things that I heard whenever I planted the journey, there's a church on every street corner in Marietta. Why are you planting another church? And that's what every church planter hears, no matter where they plant a church, mind you, on the planet Earth, especially in America, though. There's churches everywhere. Why are you going to plant another church? Well, you know, I, every church on every street corner in our area was, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I bet you they were all planted by people who believed in the gospel, were passionate about Jesus, and wanted to share their faith. But have, have they all ended that way? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, I think, I think a lot of churches in America, you know, they start out well. There's a season of time in which they thrive teaching about Jesus, teaching about the gospel. But then just as is the case in our area everywhere, and, uh, we get distracted and, and movements that were originally about Jesus and his gospel can be distracted into so many other things and be known for so many other things than the gospel of Jesus. We, you know, we have our, our political activist churches, right? And that's on both sides. You can usually tell by the sign outside the door, the decorations around or whatever. Oh, there's the left-leaning church. And over here, that's clearly the right-leaning church. You know, they become the political activist church. And it's, it's tempting to get into political movements and conversations. We get frustrated by those things and want to talk those things out. But you got some churches that are just distracted by the, self, the, the self-help motivational style of ministry, you know, they get into that pop psychology that people crave and love. You know, it's it's the it's the zinger of psychology. All right, we get into those those self help things, and you got the the signs and wonders churches that you know. Oh, great, yeah, we love Jesus and everything, but but enough about that. Let's do something. I want, I got special powers. I want to do something cool. You know, you got churches that are just all about that all the time, and then the one that really gets on my nerves in our culture is the. It's what I, what I like to call, and you've heard me refer to it as this before, it's the Showbiz Pizza Church. I'm, you know, you remember Showbiz Pizza. That was before Chuck E. Cheese back in the day. But the Showbiz Pizza Church is just like the, the pick-me of churches. You know, please, please pick us. Please come to our church. We'll do anything if you just come to church here, please. Oh, we'll make you feel good and take care of your kids for an hour. Deal? Anything. Please. Please come to our church. You know, that's, that's the big trendy church right now, the entertaining church. And it works. It works. But you can get so caught up in catering to people and putting on the show that Jesus is practically an afterthought. Critical thinking when it comes to our faith is practically an afterthought. But any gathering of the local church is prone to wander just like you and I as individuals are prone to wander, right? We need accountability and we need this gathering to go back to God's word, to be rebuked by one another, to be encouraged by one another, and to to stay on point, to stay on task. I mean, again, like the political gospel, it's it's attractive at times. The self-help gospel is attractive at times. The prosperity or poverty gospel is attractive at times. The entertainment gospel, attractive at times. But here's the thing about all of those things. They're not really gospels at all. They don't, they don't function in the way the one true gospel functions. Because when we are talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it solves a dilemma that no other gospel can solve. God is perfect and we are not. God is the perfect judge and his wrath will come down on sin and does come down on sin. We have to Uh, account for our sins this gospel saves us from the wrath of God no other gospel can say that no other gospel can do that you can be distracted by all these other things you can get on board with all of these other things but they do not appease the wrath of God that's what the gospel of the Bible is about a lot of these other churches practically erase the wrath of God altogether Well, no wonder they don't think the gospel of Jesus Christ is important if you erase the wrath of God that we learn about in Scripture. So here's what was happening, though, in Galatia. And amongst the Galatian churches, the false gospel that was beginning to take a stronghold there was a works-based gospel. They still recognized the wrath of God, 
But when it came to appeasing the wrath of God, they believed that you had to do something or that would not happen. See, that's very different than the gospel that Paul preached. When Paul preached about Jesus, it was a faith-based gospel. We have faith not in our works. We believe and have hope in nothing that we do, but everything that Christ has done. It's the works of Christ alone, according to the New Testament, that saves me from the wrath of God. So we don't add anything to it because Jesus is a perfectly sufficient Savior. We don't try to add a single iota to it. I don't help him save myself. I don't help him save you. I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and the works of Christ alone. That's it. And we have to keep coming back to that truth, or you and I will wander away from it. So these false teachers in Galatia were teaching a works-based salvation from the wrath of God, and they were troubling the churches of Galatia, and they were distorting, according to Paul, distorting the gospel of Christ. They'd say, hey, Jesus is great. You know, you, you want to believe in the whole Jesus thing, that's, that's great, but listen, he's actually not all sufficient. He, he got almost all the way there in terms of your salvation. In terms of, of, of saving you from the wrath of God, he did almost everything that it that it takes, but not quite enough. You still need to add something to it. You still need to do something or else God will not accept you. And here was that something in their day. That something in their day was circumcision. These churches in Galatia were full of Gentiles. Gentile is the word for anyone that's not a Jew. And so they weren't circumcised. They, weren't, they didn't grow up as a Jew and, and get circumcised. If, if you want to know more about circumcision, <laughs> talk to your parents or Google that. <laughs> I'll save that for later. I, you know, I really went into detail at a youth event once to explain that, and I'm just never going to do that again. <laughs> I, I'm scarred. Oh, man. They said you got to get circumcised or it doesn't count. You can love Jesus. He can love you. Oh, that's great. But if you're not circumcised, you're not saved from the wrath of God. That was their issue. That's the one that, that, that they, they would die on that sword. And see how they added something to the gospel? That drove Paul insane. It drove him nuts. He, it made him crazy. He preached against that constantly. Every time he planted a church, like, that's the number one issue I came here to tell you about. Don't try to add to the work of Jesus. What are you doing? Can you imagine if someone showed up here like that today? If they showed up and said, wow, you know, we really like the journey. You guys gather here and, and do your Bible study and sing songs and take up an offering and you do everything, all those things a, a good church should do. But you know what? You do one thing wrong. Uh, you don't take communion right. Let's say they walked in here and said, uh, yeah, those, that communion, that's actually grape juice. In the Bible, they did real wine. And so you're not, you're not doing real wine, so that doesn't count. Uh, so you're all going to go to hell. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. But that's not enough. Can you imagine someone trying to take a sacrament like that and saying that if we don't do that perfectly right, God doesn't love us? Well, we do it all the time in the Christian faith. Can you imagine them saying, hey, you know, you, you don't take communion right, you should all be drinking out of one cup. You know, you go to the churches, some of them do one cup. Have you noticed how differently communion is, is, is done in all of the different denominations and things like that? Well, they, they can't all be right. If you're doing it wrong, you're going to hell. Like, right? we, we have this mentality sometimes. We take something that is good and holy, and we elevate it to a work of salvation. That's not what we're supposed to do. We don't want to create a new law that we have to live up to perfectly or you're not saved. Then we're no further along than what we were before Jesus. That's the point of Galatians. There's a lot of different ways to get baptized. Have you noticed that? Oh, man, all sorts of different views on baptisms, all sorts of different ways to practice it. Hope you pick the right one. We don't want to treat sacraments of God like works of salvation. Those things are right and good and holy and critical to our participation in the kingdom of God. I don't want to downplay those things, but they are not works of salvation. They are not a work that we do so God will love us. Christ provided all of that. 
So in, in their day, they were, they were emphasizing circumcision. And so that's what Paul had to correct. No, they're distorting the gospel. If there's, if there's anything that we should get really protective of in the Christian faith, like an issue we should really die on our sword uh, uh, on, it, it should be this issue. It should be this issue. Did you see how strongly Paul talks about it? The language that he uses, how passionate he is about this. If you are reading an apostle being so passionate about something like this, like shouldn't you be passionate about that too? We're supposed to follow these teachings. He says, even if I teach something contrary to this gospel, that, that is saving people. Even if I teach something different, you should reject me. I should be accursed. That accursed, that word accursed, it's anathema. That's what it means to be damned. That's how, that's the length to which Paul is taking this. If I preach to you a different gospel, may I be damned to hell. May God's wrath come down on me. He says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be anathema, accursed. Let him be damned. Anyone, me, angels, anyone, let them be damned if they change the gospel message. Wow. Wow. How important is this issue? How serious should we be taking this issue? The issue of grace. Man, that is the issue. It's grace. We're saved by grace. These words are strong from Paul. He's putting a line in the sand. And you should put a line in the sand too when it comes to this. Anytime you put a line in the sand, anytime you talk about an issue that's divisive such as this, um, it's going to make people mad. It just is. People get passionate when you have, what's the two things you're not supposed to talk about? You're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. And I talk about both all the time. It, it, people get uncomfortable. People are passionate about these things. Do you hear how Paul justifies this? That, that verse 10 there. For, I, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? What are you doing? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. I wouldn't be doing this at all, Paul says. If this is about pleasing man, making man happy, I wouldn't be doing this. This makes people mad. That's one of the most relatable verses in the Bible as a pastor. <laughs> like, you know, as a pastor, you, you, you don't have the luxury of concealing everything you believe, right? You, you, you're preaching about everything you believe. It's always on display. It's always out there to be picked apart and debated with and things like that. And so rejection just comes with the territory of being a pastor. You put your, your, all of your beliefs on display and guess what? You're going to be rejected by a lot of people. If it's your, just like when you put your political beliefs on display, you're going to be rejected by a lot of people. You put your religious beliefs on display, you're going to be rejected by a lot of people. And I don't like that. I don't like that. That's my least favorite part about this job, because I don't like being rejected by people. Deep down, I don't think this is a secret. You can probably tell by my personality. I'm a people pleaser. I enjoy pleasing people. Like, I, I do. I, I enjoy making people happy. I like being accepted by people. I like being loved by people. I don't, I think I'm just being honest here, right? I, I like making people laugh. I like to joke because I like to see you smile. Bringing you joy brings me joy. I like to please people. But I'm in this profession where I can't please everyone if I say what I believe. <laughs> so it's quite the dilemma. It's something you have to get over. And you as a Christian, you should have convictions. You should have those beliefs that if people know, they're going to reject you. You should have those beliefs. If you don't have those beliefs, you're, you're not even trying. So when I get to an issue like works-based salvation versus faith-based salvation, when you really start to flesh that out and answer all the questions there, it gets divisive in a hurry. And so there's a little voice in the back of my head when I come up to issues like this in Scripture that says, please don't mention that in your sermon. <laughs> Maybe, maybe downplay that a little bit. Move on. If you, if, you, if you draw a real hard line here, people are going to leave. It's happened before. People have gotten up right in the middle of my sermon. As soon as I make the point or state the belief, man, they're just up and gone, and I never see them again. Maybe get an email later or something like that, or, or I get the, the breakup phone call. I get that from time to time. 
So pastors stay, no wonder pastors stay away from the hard stuff. People criticize churches all the time, say, oh, well, you go to this church, they just talk about all the fluffy stuff and self-help. Well, nobody gets mad at you when you're preaching self-help. That's why they preach that. That doesn't irritate anyone. That's not a line in the sand. You should help yourself. No one's like, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> like, right? Everybody's ready to be on board with self-help. But if you start talking about theology, theology and doctrine according to what it says in Scripture, that, that's hard. People, people will stay away from that. When you preach the content of Scripture, it actually repels just as many people as it compels to believe it. I mean, I, I think all the time, like, man, I wish I could control how people receive this. I wish I could, could control this in such a way that whenever I stated these hard truths that people would just be on board and be happy about it. But I can't control that. I, I, it's not my job to manipulate you. It's just my, my job to present to you the contents of Scripture. Say, so here it is. Of course, I want to take your feelings into consideration, but sometimes you just got to say it like it is. So let me just say it like it is, not taking your feelings into consideration. Here's the gospel. If you are saved from the wrath of God, it's because you are saved by grace through faith. And it's not a work of your own. It's a gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. It's not from you. It's from God. That, of course, is from Ephesians chapter 2, just word for word, but that's how it is. You disagree with that, you're disagreeing with the Bible. It's grace. If you read, if you read not from works, but then in the back of your mind you say, well, actually, you got to do this right, well, then you're, you're rejecting not from works. You're rejecting what Paul is saying. You're saying that, no, actually, there has to be a work there or you're not saved. You don't want to disagree with Paul. That's, of all the people, don't disagree with Paul. He's an apostle. You don't want to be guilty of distorting the gospel of Jesus. You don't want to be divisive to the church in a way that would point people towards a different gospel that's not really there. It's a mirage. It doesn't save you from the wrath of God. That's why it's so critical to us as the journey to take communion every Sunday. That's why it's so important that when we gather, we take communion every single time. Not because if we don't, God won't love us. That's not why we do it. We don't take communion every single week in fear of God not accepting us. We take it to be reassured that the works of Christ alone have saved us. So when you and I take communion, we think, despite all of your failures last week, God still loves you because of Jesus. Isn't that reassuring? Isn't that, doesn't that bring you peace? You think of the ways that you, you, you just messed up your life this week. I don't know what kind of poor decisions you made this week, but we've all made them on some level. You go to communion to remember God still loves you just as much as he ever has and just as much as he ever will because of Jesus. Ah, oh, what a relief. What a relief. Despite all of the reasons you have provided God to give up on you. He still loves you. Why? Because of Jesus. Because when I stand before God, it's his righteousness that counts for me. So he loves me just as much now as he ever will. God can't love me any more right now. He can't accept me any more right now than he ever will. Because it doesn't, it doesn't include my works. It doesn't include my performance. It's about the performance of Jesus when we stand before God. We're saved by grace. We're, we're given his righteousness. So when we stand before God, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. That's what we put our faith in. When I stand before God, I'm not worrying that I worked off my sin. Because Jesus atoned for all of it, past, present, and future. I don't contribute anything to my salvation except the works of except the sins that necessitated the works of Christ. That's the only thing you and I contribute. In the salvation equation, you contributed the sin. That was your part. That's why you needed saved. Jesus contributed the salvation. So we're just sinners here. We're saved by grace. We can't boast in a single thing that we do. I, I can't look at any of your lives and compare it to my life and think, oh, wow, well, I... 
after looking at your life, I can really tell God loves me more. Or I, I, I feel better looking at your life because now I know I'm saved because I, I, I performed better than that. We, we don't do that here. There's no point in doing that. It doesn't work into the equation whatsoever. We have no leg to stand on. We're all equally as guilty. We're all equally, equally uh, as, as worthy of the, of the wrath of God to be poured out on us because we're sinners. But we're saved by grace. We are loved unconditionally by God. And if you get lazy in what you believe, you're going you're gonna to walk away from that. The world's going to have a way of convincing you that that's not true. You know, when you talk about unconditional love, and you start really fleshing that out doctrinally, it gets complicated. Can I be honest with you? You know, I, I, I imagine I throw out zingers too in my sermon, but it's never quite that simple. When you really start to think about unconditional love, God loves us unconditionally. <laughs> like when you really start ironing that out. Be, so if you get lazy with that and don't look into that more and think about that more and see how that works out in Scripture, you're going to be prone to wander away from that. Here's the paradox of the Christian faith that we learn in the contents of Scripture. The Christian faith teaches us this. We are loved unconditionally by God because Jesus met all of the conditions to be loved by God. That's the paradox that's here. Well, that blows our minds. But that's the gospel of Jesus. Jesus met all of the conditions necessary to be loved and accepted by God. We put our faith in him, in his works that met all of those conditions, and we can say with confidence that we are saved. We can sing with confidence, as we did in the hymn earlier, that God actually delights in us. How could God delight in you? Because of Jesus. That's why he delights in us. He loves us unconditionally because of Jesus. That's the message that we live our lives around. That's the message that we share with others. It's this free gift of salvation through Christ. Let's remember that in communion and, and, and sing about it together. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for this rebuke in Galatians. Lord, I, we need rebuke in our lives. We, there are so many times in our lives that we get lackadaisical in our beliefs. We get lazy in our understanding of the gospel, and so we get duped by so many things in this world. We get to where we want to run after so many different uh, mirages. You know, we just get a mouthful of sand. There's nothing there. Nothing saves us from your wrath but the gospel of Jesus. Help us to stay true to that. Help us to be faithful to that, Lord. By your grace, through your spirit, may we proclaim that and, and, and stay true to that. Lord, when we think about how our belief plays out and all of the different divisions and debates within Christianity, it's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's such a heavy weight. Lord, help us to just go to your word and find the answers there and be true to what you tell us. Lord, if we're going to die on any sword in our faith, help us to die on this sword. Why would we want to believe that we have to add a work? You tell us not to believe that, but why would we want to? Well, Lord, it's trust issues. We don't want to trust you. So, Lord, I pray that we would repent of that desire to not trust you, that we would put our faith completely in you and what you've done, and we can rest in your grace today. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.